right. I think we've got it set then. All right. And this will be a video for those watching later from our class. Good morning to you both. And uh, let us pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, your word is truth. And in your word, uh, you show us our sin through the law that we might be led to repentance. And you also show us our salvation through the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose death on the cross has paid for our sins and whose resurrection grants unto us everlasting life with you. Let our hearts be so tuned to your word that we may daily repent of our sins and rise to newness of life through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, I'm not sure if the recording will actually have this all mirror or backward, because that's how it is, so just bear with me. Um, a review from last week is that we have three books that we generally use in this class, the Bible, the hymnal, and the catechism. The catechism of Martin Luther is what we're going to learn a little bit about today, just like last week we learned a lot about the Bible. The catechism's... Uh, wording will actually be printed on your sheets week after week, so that's why we don't have you buy a whole booklet just yet. But by the end of this class, a Lutheran will want their own copy of the Catechism. Uh, the Bible and the hymnal are the ones we have laid out for you. I know some of you at home have that as well. So the Bible is the source of our faith from which we get everything. The hymnal is the practice of our faith, uh, most especially as we practice it corporately, right? Christians are not individuals. Christians are each members of one body, which is Christ. So there, there's one body and many members. So we, we most often see our practice of the faith in how we practice it together in worship and prayer, and confession and absolution and marriage and baptism, confirmation, all the stuff that's in the hymnal, in addition to the music, the hymns. So that's why we call it the practice of our faith. The catechism gives us the expression of the faith. Right? This is what scripture has taught us to believe. How do we speak that to one another as Lutherans in our marriage, in our families, with our neighbors? Uh, that expression, that speaking out of the faith is important. Uh, it'll happen for sure at the profession of faith for those who are convicted that this is the church they want to uh, believe and confess with. But it also happens throughout your life, right? expressing that faith to your own children, to your neighbors when they ask, well, what's a Lutheran? Or how are your Lutherans different than other Lutherans? That expression is important. Uh, so that's part of what we're learning here is learning how to talk about the things that Scripture teaches. So that much is review. We finished last week, after going through what the Bible is, by talking about law and gospel. And as I said in my prayer, the law is God's law. It's true from eternity. That we're going to be law. That there is only one God that can tell other gods. We should be Jesus and all of humanity. Uh, were there from the very beginning and still are true even after Christ has died on the cross and paid for our sins, it's still true that we should not do these things. Right? We should do the positive commandments. Right? We should love our neighbor. We should love our spouses. Uh, we should be generous and give towards others instead of being greedy or even stealing. Right? So the, the law applies even now. We'll go back through that again today. The gospel again is a, is a kind of old English word for good news. And the good news is that we are forgiven of our sins for Jesus' sake, who died on the cross and rose from the grave. So and that, that all fits together. It's not just the good news that God says, ah, I don't care anymore. Some people think that's what forgiveness is. That God just kind of overlooks sin and stops caring about it. So I can just keep on sinning however I want. That's not forgiveness, that's what we call licentiousness, right? A license to sin. God doesn't do that. He, that would make God a liar, right? That God says adultery is wrong, but now he's like, eh, it's okay. That's wrong. That's, that would make God a liar. He doesn't lie. It's wrong. He forgives sin, not arbitrarily, not randomly. He forgives it by punishing his son, right? By putting his own son into our human flesh to bear our sin, to bear our punishment, and the full wrath of God, right? That is what the good news is. Not that God just lets us all off the hook. It's that he punishes his son in our place. That sacrifice of Jesus is the good news. All right, so now we can start with our sheet. Anybody watching this that didn't get one in an email, just let me know. The small catechism of Martin Luther. 
The word catechism comes from Greek, and a catechism is a handbook. That's not what the Greek word translates to. We'll get to that in a second. But what we generally have in Christian history, even before the Lutheran Reformation, is that a catechism is a basic handbook or summary of the Christian faith. And we talked about that last week. The Bible is a large book with 66 books in it that often repeat lessons and teach it in greater detail. Summaries of that are a good thing, and the church has been practicing that since the very beginning. Right? The creeds are little summaries of what the Bible teaches. A catechism is a little summary of what the Bible teaches. The word catechism comes from the Greek from kat echo, and you can imagine echo as exactly what we know it to be, a back and forth of the noise, right? So it was taught by for centuries by recitation and repetition. Right? Before they were writing everything out and printing everything with the printing press, catechism was done chiefly by recitation. I say this, you say it back to me. Right? Parents doing it for their children, pastors for their parishioners, and it would be repeated. Right? You don't just recite it once, you have to repeat it if it's going to be ingrained. So how did they learn the Lord's Prayer that Jesus gave in Matthew 6? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Well, you teach it to your children by repetition. I still do this in our preschool classrooms. They can't read yet. I don't just put the Lord's Prayer on the board and expect them to read it. I have to slowly go through and say, repeat after me. Our Father who art in heaven. And they all go, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. How? Hallowed be my name, because they don't get thy yet. So, I mean, that's just the fun of it. And we do that with other things. We do it with the Pledge of Allegiance. They don't know what half the words mean. Pledge, allegiance, indivisible, liberty, just, they don't know what half those words mean. Our Congress doesn't know what half those words mean. So you teach them the words through recitation and through repetition, and the understanding follows later on. Right? The understanding of what those words mean comes much later. For instance, in the Lord's Prayer, are they going to know necessarily what temptation and deliver us from evil really mean? No, they'll learn that in time. You're just teaching them the words. Right? And every parent does this with their children, with language in general. There's nothing more foolish than to say that you're going to uh, let your children choose their own religion. You don't let them choose their own name or their own citizenship or their own language. You're not like, well, I'm not going to talk to my child. I don't want to shoehorn them into English. I'm going to let them pick what language they learn then they won't, right? Then, I mean, that would be child abuse. They would not have a language, right? So we have to do this. Let's do it in the Christian faith as well. So that's what the catechism is all about. It is geared towards children. It's intended for children and new believers. In the early church, it was very heavily geared towards uh, converts to Christianity from other pagan religions in the Greco-Roman world. There's not just one pagan religion or one pagan god. There were many. And people would have to leave those religions to follow Christ. And absent everybody having a little pocket Bible, because they didn't have those, you teach the faith through repetition and recitation. So that's what the catechism has always been and still is. When we say the catechism, it refers to the chief texts of Holy Scripture and the Christian faith. So yes, we are saying that some parts of the Bible are more important than others. Right? That's what we mean when we say the chief texts. Uh, not that they are truly, in essence, more important than any other part of Scripture, but that these are the parts that really capture what everything else says. And that will be more clear as we get into them. Martin Luther wrote his explanation of these texts in 1528 in response to the horrible conditions in the churches of his day. So this is 11 years after the Reformation started. 11 years. That's a long time. To get around to this. Some of the people out in the country churches have been asking Luther for this for a long time, and he didn't think it was that important. He kept trying to shirk it off to some other colleague, go visit the churches and help them struggle through this correction in church teaching. Finally, he goes on the visitation and realizes how bad it is that Christians in the churches, sometimes even their priests, did not know the Ten Commandments or the Lord's Prayer or the Creed. Not the theological explanations, just the words, right? They could not say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. They didn't know that. So that's why he had to put it into a catechism form. Originally, it was printed on big posters, so they could have one big poster in the church hall for that, and also booklet form. For the small catechism, he wrote it for a seven- or eight-year-old's level of understanding. 
Right? So we're using that for adults. The large catechism was given for the adults as well. Uh, but here the seven and eight year olds have this in their understanding and the head of the house is meant to teach it, right? Fathers to their children, mothers assisting with that and sometimes filling in where the dad can't, right? If he's away at military duty or something, it falls to the mother. So that's how the catechism is designed. Every one of the six chief parts begins with the Ten Commandments as the head of the household should teach it to his children. And in their day, if you had servants, the head, the master would also teach it to his servants. They, that's why God has given you the wealth and the servants you have to teach them the faith, to give them Sunday off to go to church, to be a generous and kind master instead of a, a cruel one. So it applied to the whole household. Everybody who would cross your threshold should be a Lutheran and confess this faith. The six chief parts that we see here were in the catechism before the Lutheran Reformation. They're as old as the third century. Right, so when we say these are the chief texts, this isn't just us Lutherans cherry-picking what we like best. The church, of all times and places, has seen these six parts of Scripture as the, as the basic summary that encompasses everything else. Right, so they are the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, the Sacrament of Baptism, Confession and Absolution with the Office of the Keys, and the Sacrament of the Altar, also called Holy Communion. So those six chief parts are the summary of what all the Bible teaches. And you could find it in the most obscure places in Scripture and use that as your key to understanding what's, what's it talking about. The Ten Commandments are a summary of all God's law. Right? God's law, as we're going to see, goes from Genesis 1 to Revelation 21. But if you need a simple way to summarize it, the Ten Commandments is as good as it gets. Same with the Apostles' Creed. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 21, you're going to get who God is and what he does. How do you put that into, you know, a bite-sized piece to confess in church? Well, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed do a pretty good job of that. Right? So that's why we call it a summary. And then prayer and the means of grace make up the next four. The Lord's Prayer is a great summary for all prayer. I know pastors who have gone through every single one of the 150 psalms in Scripture and kind of given them one of the one of the petitions of the Lord's Prayer as a heading. Luther did that even. You know, this this psalm shows us, give us this day our daily bread. This psalm, this psalm shows us, deliver us from evil. This psalm shows us, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others. I mean, you can do that and you're like, wow, yeah. Every prayer we could possibly pray fits under one of the parts of the Lord's Prayer. Amazing. And then the means of grace there. Baptism, absolution, communion. Those are the three ways, uh, in addition to the general preaching of the word, that God gives us that grace. Now, that gospel of Jesus' death and resurrection is brought to us here today. Because we weren't there when he died on the cross. We're here today. How does it get brought to us? Through these three means of grace. All right, so that's the, the summary of the six chief parts and the small catechism. As I mentioned, there's a large catechism as well. The large catechism were sermons that Luther preached on those six chief parts. Here at the church, for I think it's $24, you can get both in one volume, small and large catechism. Small is only about 40, 50 pages. In addition to those six chief parts, it has some daily prayers, it has some Bible passages for our different callings in life. We'll go through that later on. But the large catechism is really great stuff. I mean, really excellent expanded teaching on what we're learning here today. So let's go back to your sheet and start the Ten Commandments. What is the law of God? Well, short answer, the commands and prohibitions of what God calls good and evil. God's law is written on man's heart. Romans 1, nat we call this natural law. But because of the fall into sin, we do not know how sinful we are or what actions are and aren't sinful. This must be revealed. All right, so that already gets us to the, this one distinction that I believe I mentioned last week. That when we, uh, we as Christians uh, see that knowledge can come about two ways. There's natural knowledge of God, of his law, of right and wrong, and there's revealed knowledge. This is a... a a presupposition of Christians that if God does exist, and we obviously believe he does, 
then he is capable of revealing himself. Not everyone believes that. Obviously, atheists don't believe that. Deists would not. So a deist is someone who may be out of philosophy, just thinks a God exists, but we can't know much about him. This is the, the analogy is a watchmaker, right? God created the universe like a watchmaker creates a clock, and then he just steps back and does not intervene, doesn't touch it, it just runs. That's called deism. It's a very impersonal God. And there's some Christians who I think their view of the world is a lot closer to deism than it is to Christianity. Because Christianity assumes that God can and does interact with his creation, intervenes in the form of miracles, intervenes in the form of speech, that he can actually talk to prophets and apostles and tell us the way things are. We believe that. Deists and philosophers generally don't. They kind of limit it to natural knowledge of God, that a God exists and maybe the most reasonable thing is to believe that there's only one God rather than many gods. And, you know, it's just very philosophical, cold, impersonal, and it doesn't save. We're not saved by believing a God exists. We're saved by believing in that God taking on human flesh and dying for our sins. That is the saving thing. So just believing that a God exists doesn't do much for me. All right, so natural knowledge of God or of his law and of and then revealed knowledge. In the terms of law, natural knowledge would deal with things like conscience, that even non-Christians will have a guilty conscience when they do something that we as Christians know is against the law, God's law, right? That a, someone would commit murder and they know it's wrong, even if nobody catches them. And we see this in the proof that other world religions and other nations that aren't Christian do punish some of these things, maybe even more strictly than we do. You think about Asian cultures that have a supremely high view of the fourth commandment, honor your father and mother. It is a terrible shame to disobey your parents. To bring shame to your parents is to be kicked out of the community. We don't do that anymore. Maybe we're the ones who have missed something. Right? So they, they're they showing us that they also get that principle, that natural knowledge that something's wrong about disobeying your parents. Murder, adultery, stealing, all those things kind of fit within the realm of natural knowledge of the law. Uh, and that's why we even call it natural law, that nature alone teaches us that it is wrong for a mother to kill her child in her womb or outside the womb. It takes a very warped conscience and a warped society somehow teach itself that that's actually okay, which is where we're at. It have been since Roe v. Wade and probably earlier, right? That's warping the natural knowledge. That's warping natural law and really searing and hardening the conscience against what it obviously says. So this does require some reason and intellect. Uh, same with the natural knowledge of God. We'll come back to that in the first article of the Creed later on. Someone could look at creation and just deduce, wow, all of this, the mountains, the seas, something had to create this. It can't be random chance. Okay, that's natural knowledge of God, that the heavens themselves declare that somebody created this, uh, that it's not random chance. None of that really gets us to the gospel, though. Natural knowledge of God or of the law can never quite bring us to repentance. And it definitely does not give us the gospel, because natural knowledge of the law usually gets us into pride. Maybe despair, right? If you've actually done something wicked, like murdered somebody, and you don't know the Christian law and gospel, murdering somebody, now you're stuck. You don't know anything about Jesus' atonement. You know it is wrong, but you have no you have no healing and forgiveness. Right? So if you've actually done something against your conscience and law, the natural law, you're in despair. Most people, though, would find themselves in pride. I've never murdered anybody. I've never stolen anything other than maybe a kid taking his neighbor's toys or something small. Right? The natural knowledge is always good at justifying itself. Well, yeah, I stole, but it was only a couple of grapes from the store. and you know, I was really just sampling them to see if I wanted to buy the bushel or not. Yeah, great, you justified yourself, you're still a thief, right? 
So natural knowledge of the law will often leave us in pride, saying, I'm pretty good. I'm better than most people. I don't do X, Y, or Z. I'm pretty good. It takes the revealed knowledge of God's law to show us that we are all sinful. Right? Natural knowledge might say nobody's perfect. That's not the doctrine of original sin, which we will cover today. Nobody's perfect. I, myself, am a poor, miserable sinner, a blind, dead enemy of God who deserves wrath and hell. Natural knowledge never comes to that conclusion. That takes God revealing it. Right? In terms of medical, you need the doctor to diagnose you. You think you've got a little bit of a pain in your side? It's actually an inoperable tumor, and you're going to die. Right? That's the difference that we're talking about here. You need a doctor, the Lord God, to actually reveal to you how sick, how bad, how lost you are. Not because he likes causing you grief, but because that repentance is what makes way for the gospel. And the gospel can only be revealed now. No unbeliever wandering around in nature is going to deduce from nature that God's Son took on human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, lived during the first century AD, died on the cross, and rose from the grave. You can't deduce that from looking at a mountain. You need someone to reveal that in his word, in the preaching of the word, right? So that is absolutely revealed knowledge only. Natural knowledge never comes to the gospel. It can get pretty close on the law, but only to the point of pride or despair. It doesn't get repentance. It does not understand that God is merciful and will forgive us our sins. All right, so that's that's my uh, explanation here of that law of God, good and evil, natural and revealed. Questions on that? Again, it does assume something. We are assuming along with what the Bible assumes, that if a God exists who is all-powerful, he is capable of interacting with and revealing things to his people, to the people he created. That's the presupposition, just to be clear. Next question on your sheet, what types of law are in the Bible? We blitzed through this very fast last week. Now I want to do it in a Venn diagram, since I know that's always helpful. We are going to have the moral law, we're going to have the civil law, and we're going to have the ceremonial law. The moral law points us to the office, or Christ's office of prophet. A prophet preaches the word of God. It is true always. So it stands forever. The moral law stands forever. It's still binding on Christian consciences. God does not want us to murder. God does not want us to steal or to commit adultery or to have other gods or to misuse his name or to despise his word. God does not want that for our lives. So that is the moral law. The ceremonial law, especially in the Old Testament, had to do with the tabernacle, the temple, the worship rites of the people of Israel. All of those are pointing forward to Jesus Christ as our true and final high priest, the one-time sacrifice for sin. It is fulfilled at his death and resurrection. They no longer apply. Right? They served a limited purpose. They are fulfilled. The ceremonial laws do not apply. Jesus himself says this in the Gospels, that he has declared all things clean. It's highlighted in the book of Acts at the Gentile Pentecost. Gentile is a word for any non-Jew. Right? So we, we use that word a lot in church. Gentiles means anybody not from the Jewish race. Well, in the book of Acts, they become Christians with a very pronounced vision that God gives to Peter regarding they are now clean. The dietary laws are off the table. Even the, the law of circumcision of the Old Testament, off the table. All of that is no longer applied. Uh, even the temple is no longer needed. Jesus taught that in his ministry, that he was the fulfillment of the temple. The book of Hebrews spells that out too, which is why Jesus could and did prophesy and predict that the temple would be destroyed and no longer needed, and it is. Right? There is no temple in Jerusalem for Jews to worship at, and there hasn't been since 70 AD. 
30 years after Jesus' ascension, the Roman Empire got tired of rebellions there, and so they burned down the temple. The Wailing Wall that still is there that Jews make pilgrimage to is not even really part of the temple. It's a retaining wall. What's actually built there now is an Islamic mosque. I mean, you want to talk World War III? Yeah, go fight about who gets that temple mount. Yeah, that's a, that's a hot topic. Going over to the civil law, we know that Israel was a nation state in the Old Testament. They had their own governance up until the time the Babylonians conquered them, and then they were ruled by other foreign people until like the 1940s when Britain granted Israel a charter that made them another nation, a modern nation state. So that's a whole historical lesson we don't have time to get into. Modern-day Israel is not the same thing as Old Testament Israel. Not close, right? So the civil law understood that there is an Old Testament nation. They need civil laws and civil punishments. It does point forward to Christ being the king of his people, but it is also fulfilled in him and no longer applies to Christians. A Christian nation does not have to follow the punishment system of the Old Testament people. In both of these cases, you know, our church and our society don't have to follow the same rules. Because they are fulfilled, they served a purpose of setting Israel apart as a holy people, as a people distinct from whom the Messiah would come. Now, the church should be that distinct in this area, right? Christians should not have the same rate of divorce and adultery as non-Christians. But that doesn't mean we have to you know, require them to have a seven-day purification period or stone them to death, right? So that's where there are, there are overlapping things here. Let's just take the sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. That is morally wrong. Always has been, always will be. You shall not commit adultery. A ceremonial law might be from the Old Testament that after such a person has to go through a period of purification before they are allowed to come to the temple even. Well, in the Christian faith, there is still some overlap with that. If you are unrepentant, we do not commune you. When you do con uh, confess, we absolve you and you commune. No seven-day waiting period or 40-day waiting period for that purification rite. But there is still purification that takes place. It's called absolution. Right? So that does still happen. The civil law would say... You also have to stone the adulterer to death. Okay. The overlap here, so that overlap would be right here. You stone them to death for adultery. Our nation still does have on the books some punishments for adultery. The state of Minnesota still has it on the books that it should be one year in jail and a $5,000 fine. It's not enforced. So it's not really law, right? I think we all learned that last year with some of the COVID executive orders. If there's no enforcement, it's not really a law. So nobody who's committing adultery needs to worry about some rogue policeman and prosecutor throwing them in jail for a year and charging them $5,000. So it's essentially legal, legal behavior. We'll come back to this when we talk about the uses of God's law. So in the civil society, we in our moral law, as Christians would say, maybe the government should punish adultery. That would be something Christians could advocate for. Not in the church. We're not going to have our own version of Sharia law like Islam, where we want permission to have higher capital offenses than our state does. We're not going to ask for that. Our response would be to ask the civil government to do their job. If, mur if abortion is murder, the government should make it illegal. We're not going to take it into our hands as church. They need to do what God has given them the sword to do. Make it illegal, protect the women and children, punish the people who would, who would use this. And so that's an example of, of how they overlap. And so you can understand when non-Christians look at a topic like gay marriage or homosexuality and say, ah, you Christians keep calling it sin. Why, don't you, why are you eating shellfish? Or they'll take some random ceremonial law, or they'll say, you, now you're, if you're going to say that homosexuality is a sin, you're also going to say that we have to stone them to death. No, I don't blame them for not knowing the distinction of the law. I do blame them for being so arrogant that they don't even ask us for our explanation. 
right? There is an explanation, right? The, the, the ceremonial laws of dietary restrictions is clearly removed in Scripture by Jesus Christ. Does not apply to us. Doesn't apply to the issue of homosexuality at all. So completely out of left field. The civil laws and the civil punishments, no, we can have a separate discussion about whether there should be any sort of civil litigation, prevention, or punishment for it. That's, the, that's a separate debate. If we're just talking about what is sinful and needs repentance, that's a different discussion. Uh, they don't see it that way. and they're, they're always going to misunderstand that. And we can, we can be the ones who calmly respond and don't just retort, uh, but actually try to explain this difference to them if they're willing to hear it very often or not. Next section then, God's law revealed in Holy Scripture has three uses. The first one is called the curb. That means correcting and rebuking evildoers. I didn't put this on your sheet. You could add it if you have a pen or pencil. That's the government's job. And it's the job of parents. And we'll come back to this in the fourth commandment, but the government does not exist from eternity. The government gets its authority from the household authority. The parental authority is created in the Garden of Eden. Government authority is not natural, or it's not essential. It is what comes down from having many fathers in many places, or in one place all at the same time. Right? The parental authority is the original one that God created. So it is a parent's job to use the law to correct and rebuke their child. And on a grander societal scale, that is the job of governing authorities, judges and magistrates and policemen to correct and rebuke evil. We call it a curb because what happens when your car is drifting off the right way? You smack into the curb and it beats you back onto the road. That's the job of a curb, a guardrail. It bangs you back onto the road. Uh, it's like a, the, the bit in a horse's mouth. You use it to steer the, re the rebel horse that doesn't want to go the right way. The law has that purpose on all people. The mirror is a particularly Christian one, though, because even non-Christian societies will have some form of the curb. The mirror shows God's perfection and our sin, leading to repentance and the gospel. Right? So God's law shows us how pure our life should be. And because we are not pure, it shows us we're sinners. It shows us we don't live up to God's expectation. We need to repent. The curb doesn't have to do that, right? If the society says we have an adultery problem, how are we going to solve the adultery and divorce rates? Maybe we need to institute a one-year prison sentence and $5,000 fine. Would you have less adultery? Probably. That's the idea of deterrent, right? Part of, part of the criminal justice system is the deterrent. You would not get caught. It, I mean, you all do this when you're speeding. You kind of weigh the idea, okay, what's a speeding ticket? I can afford it. I'll do it. If it, if it includes jail time, you're not speeding, right? If you know the consequences, you are weighing your own risk of those consequences, and at some point you say, not worth it. I mean, this gets in, I mean, you can take this to the extent of the death penalty. I mean, that's where it often gets to, to be discussed, even at national levels. And, you know, what is the deterrent factor? Does it work or does it not work as a deterrent? Well, I, for one, would be fine with death penalty for rape. If actually proven and not, you know, false claims, if, it, if there's a, a significant proof of it, I'm fine with that. Child molestation, let's go for it. I mean, there... There is a punishment that is not just retributive, how you punish the person, but punishment as a deterrent to other people from doing it. That's what the curb does. Right? And that's why our states had adultery laws. We realized adultery and divorce were bad for marriages and bad for children and bad for society. This is a way we get less of it. It's a basic principle. You get more of what you subsidize, you get less of what you penalize. You penalize adultery, you're going to have less adultery because somebody's going to decide, I, I'm not spending a year in jail. Right? Before they go to that hotel room with whatever's going to happen, I'm not going to go to jail for this. They should be thinking about that solely on the grounds of their marriage and children, but you start adding a well-known and practiced punishment like that, now the curb is doing its work. 
Christians don't go down, we encourage the government to do that. We don't institute it in our own churches. Right? We don't have a prison cell in the church where we throw a member who commits sin. We don't have that authority. We'll come back to that in a different lesson. Our job with the law is to use it as a mirror to show people their sin, that they would repent and believe in the gospel. The third use of the law really only applies to Christians, because uh, an unbeliever wouldn't care about this. The law is a guide and a teacher. It tells Christians what a holy, God-pleasing life looks like, and the new man in you wants to do that. Right? The new man in you wants to have a happy marriage. And so he's not going to commit adultery. In fact, he's going to follow the Sixth Commandment's positive things and try to learn how to love and cherish his wife. Right? That's what the new man wants. The old Adam in us only fears punishment. And there's nothing righteous about that. Right? When we talk about the effects that the curb can have, let's say that the curb of the law does get us to less adultery. There's nothing righteous in that. Right? There's nothing righteous in saying, well, I would have the affair, but I, I really don't want to ruin my marriage and get thrown in jail. You're still a sinner, right? There's nothing righteous about that motivation. So the curb can produce better effects, maybe societally, but no righteousness, right? The curb alone cannot produce righteousness because you're still acting selfishly. The curb works, but it's not righteous because it only reveals our selfishness. It's not that I didn't steal it because I'm a righteous person and respects this man's right to his own personal property. It's because I didn't want to get caught and punished. I'm still only serving myself. If I was serving him, I would help him to improve and protect his possessions and income. Instead, I just, I choose not to steal it because I don't want to do the, the time. That's selfish. All right, next. Why and how do we use the Ten Commandments? So far, I've been talking about the word law, right? Law, law, law. The law is bigger than the Ten Commandments. It's from Genesis to Revelation. Why do we use the Ten Commandments? God's law is most simply and briefly set out in the Ten Commandments given to the children of Israel in Exodus chapter 20. The whole of God's law, expressed in the entirety of Scripture, explains and illustrates these commandments in greater detail. So, for instance, the, the Ten Commandments will say in commandment number five, you shall not murder. Jesus, in Matthew chapter five, says... You heard it was said of old, you shall not murder, but I say to you, anyone who hates his brother is guilty of murder. And if you are angry with your brother, you are guilty of the hell of fire. Right? So that's law. You shouldn't be angry with your neighbor. You shouldn't hate him either. But Jesus puts it under the fifth commandment. Right? So murder doesn't just mean murder. The law also talks about it in terms of hurting them, harming them, hating them, having angry outbursts at them. That's what we mean by God's law is bigger than the Ten Commandments, but the Ten Commandments are a nice summary of it. How do we use it now? Luther's explanations of these commandments are nothing more than taking the whole of God's law expressed in the totality of Scripture and applying it to the specific commandment. For example, you shall not commit adultery is explained in light of all that God says about human sexuality, including our lustful thoughts being adultery. Right? So just like I recited for you on the fifth commandment, Jesus does that with the sixth commandment too. He says, you've heard it was said of old, you shall not commit adultery. I say any of you who looks at a woman with lust in his heart has already committed adultery in his heart. Oh boy. Right? Okay. Flip the page. Let's take a couple minute break to... Uh, stretch and get a drink if you need to, use the restroom if you need to, and uh, I'll refuel to get us through the second half. <laughs>